Gut. Ja, jo. Okay, so I would start now um, with last week's homework. So the homework was due now, so I can now talk about the homework. Um, yeah, um, the actual homework, blah, 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 use cases creation. Create a matrix. How do we create um, this matrix? Well, first we make sure that what we expect is actually an iterable, and how do we test if something's an iterable? Well, um, we ask if it quacks like a duck. Iterables must have the attribute iter. So to, for something to be an iterable, it must have the attribute iter. Python's duck typing uh, wants us to ask like this and not check if it's instance iterable or something that doesn't exist in Python. But then I extract the, the length of the first line because we said it's not supposed to be ill-formed. All lines have, have to have the same as the first. And then we loop through them um, and check if they're all ins. And uh, then we can just set self dot underscore data. So our matrix class uses underlyingly um, a simple list. So in the end, we simply have a list made from this iterable here. And this is like our matrix uses um, a list. But as we provide additional um, behavior, it's useful to have this matrix cl class around this. So our matrix wraps basically a simple Python list, providing additional behavior, which is like the stuff we were supposed to do here. The second way, I told you this on uh, Tuesday already, is this factory method to create it filled. So we create, um, so we fill using a nested for loop, or in this case, um, a nested um, list comprehension um, to create the data. And then we, so this here is a static method, so we don't have the selfie, and then we return our constructor for data because we're now sure that um, this data here is um, an iterable because, well, it's obviously a list of lists because that's the way we created it. Um, yes, then uh, we said already that uh, we used the uh, representation dunder method. Why doesn't this work? Oh, that's unfortunate. Uh, we used the represent, uh, representation dunder method to create a string, and we already knew this string format stuff. So what we're doing here is um, we're joining all the rows with um, a backslash n and a comma. So we want each row to be on a separate line and having a comma in the end. So row, comma, row, comma, row. So we have to join them using a new line. And then we format that. Uh, and then we wrap simply the uh, final square brackets around that, such that it looks like this. Yes. Um, then next thing, the data readout was supposed to um, get all the data stored. But the internal data, um, it's not supposed to be modified that way. Um, this hints at using the add property decorator. So what we basically do if we call matrix.data is where we call a function matrix.data opening bracket, closing bracket. Um, but because of the add property decorator, um, we can leave out the, um, the parentheses. And thus, we only have this a.data. Because this simply returns something, it returns a copy here of our self.data. We could also return a deep copy. So from copy import deep copy, return deep copy self.data. Um, this doesn't change the self.underscore data. Um, yes, we could change uh, self. So we could, um, we could have, uh, we could um, change, for example, here uh, a.underscore data equals 0, 0, 0, 0. And then we would change the matrix. Um, but it's basically impossible to forbid that because Python doesn't have real private, method, uh, private methods or attributes. So there's no way around that. And Python only suggests. So, um, so it's, it's Python consensus that um, methods and attributes starting with the underscore, like our underscore data, are not to be changed from the outside so, or to be accessed for that matter. So yes, we could change um, matrix.underscore data, but we won't. And if we call this matrix.data, um, we simply return self.underscore data. So um, this having the underscore for uh, variables and then making getter and setter um, methods, like uh, you learned a week ago with Rudiger, is the Pythonic way of having variables. So if you have uh, or having class attributes, 
So normally you would just have the class attribute matrix.data and if you don't have any reason to suspect that like something with the data can be wrong, then you just keep the self.data and if you want to add behavior like for example for bidding um, certain values in data, then you would change this data attribute to an underscore data and make a getter and setter method um, called data each so that you can access matrix.data and if you have a setter method also change self uh, matrix.data equals something uh, to add behavior. This is the easiest and most convenient way, way because you don't need this all the time. You can simply have this attribute and up on changes of the requirements you can change the behavior without changing the interface. Okay, who got that? Ah, nobody. Nice. <laughs> Um, doesn't matter for you as long as it's explicitly asked um, a dot data is not supposed to be uh, so you're not supposed to be able to modify the data then you need simply uh, an add property decorator and have um, a private attribute if would, if it wouldn't be asked that the internal data cannot be modified by calling a dot data you could simply have um, you could leave out the underscore and simply call it a dot data and leave out this entire method Okay, um, to access and modify values where we use the get item and set item method and the coords are just, um, so what we internally do here if we return this self.underscore data is we call um, self.data.get item coords, no, coords zero dot get item coords one. So this is simply, so the list also internally has this get item which is internally called but this is a convenient way to write it. Same for set items. So what we're doing here internally is um, we call self dot underscore data dot get item with the argument uh, coords zero, and then this returns something obviously because the get item method of our list here returns something. And then we have the second coordinate, um, which we then assign a value to. So what this internally does is it called set item because Python T's there's an equal sign and then something and then we set for this nested list called zero value. So this internally, um, so this here internally maps to this um, but due to Python magic um, we never see this and due to Python method magic people calling our matrix class from the outside also don't see that um, well where are we? Let's modify values. That doing this internally calls this. Yes. And then we had the scalar multiplication. Um, if we are on the left side, so if we call matrix times a scalar, then where we simply calculate the new data, we turn a new matrix. And if we're on the right side, so if it's scalar times our matrix, we make it ourselves easy and we simply say, man, this is the same as matrix times scalar. So we can reuse our multiplication function from here. So this is the same as basically returning self, oops, self dot underscore underscore mal underscore underscore other. So this is the same because we defined it um, just a few lines before that. Okay. Any questions? Python data model. Yay. Okay. Um, there also was a bonus, was there? Yeah. Excuse me? Uh, you will after this lecture. I will upload it. So I will make the repository public. Yeah. Um, because then if we change, so then, so I'm making a copy this way. This is the same as copying it. If I wouldn't do that and I would change, um, and I would change, uh, uh, I would call self.data equals something, then I would change the original one because if I would simply return self.underscore data, um, I would return the pointer to, to the data and if I change that, I also change it in the original place. So this is the same as 
return in deep copy self dot underscore data if I import a deep copy. But this looks more clean, I think. Uh, um. Okay. Um, for the bonus task, I think I will simply upload the sample solution and can look at it. It's, I think it's not too hard. It's just logical stuff. As soon as you see the solution, I guess. All right. My screen crashed. Ah, light and dark themes. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, we finished off last Thursday on the, uh, last Tuesday on the aggregation functions. I will go through that uh, really quickly again. Um, so this will also, by the way, only take hopefully like half an hour and then we're done and then you can work on the homework. So I really hope it does. Okay, um, so I asked you to use the np.repeat last time, which doesn't repeat the way we want because if we np.repeat, uh, one, two, three, three times. This makes one, one, two, two, three, three. Uh, NP.tile does the correct thing. I forgot to mention that after making you get it with just this function. Okay, and then um, I said that the NP dot not a number is the only thing which is not equal to itself. So yay, NP.NAN is not equal to NP.NAN. However, uh, I forgot to mention that NumPy has a test to check if something is NAN, and that's simply NumPy.isNone. And NumPy.isNone, none returns two, and for everything else it returns one. So if you want to check if you have missing values in your data, you can check for NP.isNone. Um, oops, now I used it before introducing it, so I will get to this R underscore in a second. Um, as you see, it obviously, so this here are um, two arrays, and this R underscore square brackets simply concatenates these along the first dimension. So this is now 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 from this one and five zeros from this one. Um, I just wanted to create this area such that we can work with this. And well, if we divide um, this divided by itself, we made ourselves a lot, not a number, uh, many not a numbers. And like I said, if we divide through a zero, it simply says not a number. And so um, to get only the ones um, that are not not a number, we can simply have a mask and ask for all elements of this array where this is the tilde, it means not, where not the value is not a number. So this one is, so this, this um, np.nan, uh, np.isnon, I mean, um, simply returns a Boolean array, then with the tilde, we flip it, two is false and false is two, and using our masking here, we return only the two ones. So if you want to remove not the numbers, this is the way to do it. Um, another nice way uh, we could deal with that is that if we divide something, so we wanted to divide A by itself, which we did, um, which we did up here, right? So A divided by A, which had these many not numbers. If you have a good reason, if you have a good reason uh, for them not being not a number, but some other value, you could use the explicit np.divide and internally a divided by a maps to np.divide a comma a, just thanks to the Python data model and Dunder methods. Um, and you can simply provide as additional uh, keywords to the divide function um, a where such that only where this here is the case um, this division actually takes place, and an additional out argument, which means that for every um, list element, array element, where this was not the case, it's simply uh, that in, instead this value is taken. So this here means that where a is not zero, um, we divide a by a, and at all other places where a is zero, that means in this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, we simply take the value with the same index from this np.0 of the same shape as a, which is obviously zero, and thus we created something where we divided, where we well, got a round dividing by zero. Okay, as much for the not a number. I was too quick on that, I thought. 
Okay, yes, and then we left last week with the aggregation functions, uh, last week, last Tuesday. So I'm just gonna show that again here real quick. So uh, we have, for example, numpy.mean, which returns the minimum of the entire error as long as we don't provide an axis. If we do provide an axis, it keeps this dimension fixed and loops over all the others. So this is the shorter version, the um, longer version of that which we had last Tuesday is up below, uh, is up. Um, and yeah, so if we hey, take the minimum of this three-dimensional array with x is equal to zero, we take the minimum of these four elements and of these four elements and of these four elements and so on and so on. So the entry at index zero, zero, five here is the minimum of these values. So we keep um, the other dimensions um, fixed. So we loop over all over all possible values here, but for this very value, we have some fixed values, and then we take the minimum as far. Longer version. Uh, okay, um, aggregation functions, in fact, can even aggregate more than one dimension at once. So, from a three dimensional array, um, if we want, so we can even provide more than one axis, such that then the um, this index is the minimum of looping over all these values. So we loop over, um, so, we, um, so we keep x is zero fixed, or rather this is like the one position. So um, for all um, values for the zeroth axis, we calculate the minimum, and this is just one example of that, the three here. And simply then we loop over all other values. So this is the minimum here is this. And the dimension here is, um, has the other two axes removed. So um, if we look at our three dim array dot shape, um, well, this is the same as, well, it's four in all dimensions, but believe me that the shape of the resulting array is the same as the zeroth dimension. Because this is the one we're looking over. Okay, obviously there's not only zero, uh, not only zero, not only mean, but also max, and, well, many others. Oh God, now we're demonstrating all axes again. No, I will not. Why did I have it here? Oh, I thought I didn't have it here. Okay, this was the part I was, I wanted to skip. Okay, there's also max, same thing. We can take the sum. Also aggregates, we can take where the sum over x is, just the same, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so then I got an exercise for you, and that is to create a lambda function that flattens a given number array such that it is one dimensional. Um, there is a flatten function, and you can of course use that, but um, I want to point you to one very specific function here, um, such that you're supposed to only use reshape. Okay. Ah, okay, take your time, I will fix this.
hard work because I forgot to activate the environment, of course. So yeah, um, I want you to create a shape of product of all dimensions and where this is obviously um, uh, uh, an aggregation function, this product of all dimensions. Even though the countdown hasn't stopped yet, I will just continue because the countdown started like a minute later at least. Um, so what I wanted you to do here is reshape and then use np.product with the shape of x, which simply, well, x.shape is here 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, and the product of that is then, um, well, the um, 64, which is the value in one dimension we want to have. Um, can't execute it right now because I can execute it only after this time has stopped. Um, this is the same. Yes? How do you stop the timer? Uh, interrupt the kernel. Oh, okay. But this is, uh, then I would need to okay. execute this countdown from, from the top again and I don't want to. Yeah, it's annoying for you if you accidentally start the countdown a bit. Um, yes. So uh, this is the same as NumPy's. Um, Array dot flatten. So there is an array dot flatten method which simply does the same. I just wanted you to use this um, product function. All right, and then uh, let's get to um, the advanced indexing. So NumPy. So the best thing about NumPy is the way you can index arrays, and it's really way more useful than simply having um, a normal um, a normal Python list because you can simply have fancy indexes, you can have masks, you can combine the masks, and so on and so on. So, first of all, NumPy allows, damn, one hour plus. First of all, NumPy allows um, multi-dimensional indexing. So like I said, when we have um, a Python list, we simply have this one index. So this is a two-dimensional Python list, which is actually simply a list of lists. So this is a list which internally contains more lists. So if I call two dim list, at uh, the second position, I simply return this list. And then this list, again, has an underscore underscore get item method, which is well, this, when I call another square bracket, so if I uh, use another square, pair of square brackets with the one, I simply call from this list the get item method again. Um, this is, again, rather slow in Python because Python needs to check for the outer list, hey, do you have this get item method? If yes, use it, blah, blah, blah. And then for the inner list, again, do you have this get item method? If yes, use it, blah, blah, blah. Um, this doesn't sound like much, but if you do it really, really often, it's rather slow, which is um, why NumPy simply allows you to have this two-dimensional list. So I can, if I have a two-dimensional list or a two-dimensional array in NumPy, obviously, um, I can really get um, the uh, item at the position two, one. Okay. Um, yes, why did I do that again? I have no clue. Okay. Um, if we use a colon in one dimension, then we simply get all values from this dimension. So this is basically like a slice, right? So this is a slice from zero until, um, well, this large two dim array dot shape. And in this case, at the position zero. So this here is too long, and we can simply use a colon. And we can slice again. So standard slicing works as expected. So if we only have, so if we in the first dimension want all values, and in the second we want the first until um, the second, excluding the stop index, um, 
we get all values from these two columns. Right? And I could slice again here. And with this, with slicing, you can really make um, complicated sequences of numbers in really just a few lines of code. So if I only wanted to have um, every other um, row of these two columns, or if I wanted to have every other row of every other column, so these are only the even numbers, if I would start each um, at a one, I would get only the odd numbers. And there's a lot of fun you can have um, with this indexing. And it makes it really quick. All right. So yeah, here we take all rows and only every other row starting from the second until the sixth. So row, uh, columns number two, four, and six. Yes, slices of an array are always only, view only views. So um, the array itself stays at the same position, just create a new index um, to look at this chunk of memory. So if I change that, uh, if I change the value here, um, wait, where is it? Uh, so if I change, um, so we slice a row, uh, a rather a column, I mean, from this large array, and I set this here to zero, I even take a slice again, and I set this to zero, I change it in the original position. So every time you create a new slice, you only create a new view, and your original array is changed as well. Um, to not have that behavior, you can simply use um, np.copy. Right, so this is, so if we um, create a new array, so this here is how the array is basically in our, in our RAM, how it's stored, and has some attributes, blah, blah, blah. And then if we, for example, also if we reshape, so, um, so we have this shape, which means we have one, so imagine we have now the shape, and we have only um, one dimension in our shape. That means we basically have an index which is running from the first until the last element, and we can access it by this. So if we call this at the position something, at the position five, for example, I have a pointer to this position in the data buffer, or rather something smarter than a pointer, but uh, for what it's worth, it's the same. If I then, for example, call reshape, or if I take a slice, or if I do anything, I just make a new view on this array, which means I have a new set of index indices. And if I then call B um, at the position, I don't know, one, one, this simply points to the same original array as I simply called um, A at the position five. So B at the position two, one, in this case is nine, which is the same as A at the position um, nine. And if I change B at this position, I change the original array too. Same holds for reshape, same holds for slices. So if I change a slice, um, I change, so a slice returns a view, and I use the same array, and I change the original array again. Um, for that to not be the case, I would have to use um, copy. So if I um, read L2 equals np.copy, uh, I'm not even sure right now, one sec. Let's change another row to be that um, so this doesn't show anything because it was zero already. So if I now use mp.copy and I change the copy, well, then the original one is unchanged. Otherwise, the sixth column would be zero as well. Um, but our L2 has the sixth column being zero. So um, slice, uh, slices return only views. If you don't want that behavior, you have to use mp.copy, which is, however, a lot slower because it actually has to copy all the stuff from the one RAM position to the other RAM position. OK. Um, then there's the ellipsis object, which is actually an ellipsis. So if I write dot, dot, dot somewhere in Python, this is an object, namely an ellipsis. And what an ellipsis basically does, it, um, it basically makes as many colons separated by commas as we need. So imagine we have this four-dimensional array here, um, which has a shape of four by three by three by three. And we wanted to get, um, 
where all values of uh, where the first dimension is three, um, that's the same. No. That's this, okay, uh, rather not that, but imagine we wanted, um, yeah, how do you show it like this? So these are all values where the first dimension is one, and imagine from that we only wanted um, uh, the last one, then we could do it like this. So we have two colons in here, so we want the first dimension to be one. Um, we take all from the second, all from the third dimension, and then we only take the first index from the fourth dimension. This is the same as writing this dot, dot, dot. So this dot, 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 um, the ellipsis object basically um, makes as many colons separated by commas as are needed such that it still fits. So this here is the same as this here. Oh, there it is. I can move in any position so I can start with the dot, 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 comma, one. And then I take all elements um, from all dimensions, but from the fourth, I only want the ones where the values, um, where the dimension, the value of the dimension is one. All right. Um, yeah, next up, fancy indexing. Um, what's really, really useful in NumPy is that we can pass an array containing a list of indices. So imagine I have um, this array, and then I want the, four, the first, the fourth, and the fifth element. I can simply make a list, or rather an array, of the index, indices I want to have, and then I can index my array at these indices. So here I get the first, the fourth, and the fifth element of my array, which is 11, 14, and 15. And this is fancy because the resulting array even reflects the shape of the index array. So if I take one the first, the fourth, the fifth, and the seventh um, index, but I want them to be in this very shape, I can simply provide my index array in this shape, and what I get is uh, reflects the original shape. This is a really useful behavior in uh, many situations. Okay, yes, I can and have to index each dimension separately. So if I have, if I have a two-dimensional array, then I need to provide separate lists for the x indices and for the y indices, such that then I simply uh, index it at three. So if I call it like this, I take the element um, at position three, one, and the element at position four, two. So 3, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 1 would be the 9, and 4, 2 would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2 would be the 14. So if I call it like this, I would get the 10 and the 14. Yes. Um, we can do anything with this. We can, for example, swap the rows and columns of an array, um, because, well, if we simply ask, so imagine this being our normal uh, two-dimensional array, then we can simply ask, well, give it to me in the order that I first want the second dimension, then the first, and then the zeroth, and I want all columns, um, which um, then simply, uh, and I want all rows, which, swi which uh, swaps, what does it swap? Uh, ah, no, yeah. So this here now is in, so this is the first row, which became uh, the last, and vice versa, and the second one stayed at their position. Um, which is the same as this one here. So give me the array, um, but in a flipped order. Okay, um, time for another exercise. Um, well, using fancy indexing, create an array such that it is a one hot encoding of our original array. So one hot encoding, right, if we have an array of, um, so this is our A, so what we in the end want, the maximum index is two, so we want um, blah, blah, blah. We want zero, um, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero. Right, we want one hot encoding. So um, the dimensions in this dimension uh, must be the same and because the maximum here is two. Um, why do I even have the maximum here is two? Um, three dimensions are enough in this case.
um, how would we do this? Well, first of all, we create um, an array B of the correct shape. Um, okay, those, this is the transpose version of that, but it's the same thing. So we want um, this shape. So we want, we had six elements here and um, the maximum number here was a two, um, such that we need three dimensions because where well, the, the one hot indexes can either be zero, one or two. Um, and then we can use fancy indexing. Um, I can even to make it the way it was written on the board. I can show it like this. So we had this, this, Okay, so here, this is a one, this is a two, one, zero, zero, zero. Um, how did we do this? Well, we provided two indices. Um, at first, we provided simply a range um, from the from well, this of the same length as the original array, such that here we get the indexes simply zero, one, two, three, four, five, and this are then our x positions because well, we want to fill in every single row, we want to have a one. And at what y position do we want this one? Well, simply at, for the first one at one, for the second one at two, then at one, and then at zero, at zero, at zero. And then this simply fills zero, one with the one, and then it fills uh, one, two with the one, and then two, one with the one, and then three, zero, four, zero, five, zero. So we can use fancy indexing and assignment to assign all um, the one hot vectors. Does that make sense? Do you understand why this works? So we have a list of two different indices. The one is simply all the, um, the x positions. Oops or the x positions there are. And then at the corresponding x positions, we want the correct y position to be this one. And thus we set 0, 1 to a 1 here, and then we set 1, 2 to a 1, 2, 1 to a 1, and so on and so on. Making a one hot vector in two lines. It's indexing, yay. Uh, okay, um, then I use VSEC here, never mind for you, this is just to print them prettily. So imagine we have um, this array of random integers, this array of random integers and the squares of that. So we have now random integers and the square, two squared, one squared, nine squared, and so on. And imagine we wanted to um, sort them simultaneously, so we wanted to sort both A and B. So this V stack is only for demonstration purposes. These are still two separate arrays, A and B. And imagine we wanted to sort A by, um, well, from lowest to highest, but we wanted to keep um, the matching such that where the same index for B comes like that, that um, A, uh, that B at the position three is A at the position B squared. What we would have to do is we have to provide, um, we have to arc sort the indices, so such that we have this here is the uh, correct order of the indices. So this here has um, so the nine is the highest one, um, and then wait, how does that make sense? Okay, so what did we do here? What do we see? We sorted by. OK, 
Okay, why does this make sense? I mean, it does the right thing in the end. Okay, so this axor obviously provides um, blah, 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 blah. provides uh, an ordering, and then we simply take our a first, the second position of the a, which is the zero, and then we take the eighth position of our a, which is the other zero, and then we take the um, okay. So having it like this doesn't make any sense. Okay, so this is simply the correct order of the indices. Ha, ah, okay, Axort provides me the correct order of the indices. So I want the second element at first, then I want the eighth element, then I want the third element, and so on and so on, yeah? So we sort the indices in the correct order, and then we can provide uh, A with these indices, which basically sorts A, yeah? Because we get A at the second position, and then A at the eighth position, and so on, which is the correct order. And I can sort B in the same way, such that B has the same ordering as A. Okay? If we want to sort A and B by some, um, well, by, by some way of, uh, by, by some, uh, from A, then we can simply use arcsort to get the indices in the correct order, and then index both our arrays at these indices. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Okay. Yes. And I told you already about masking. So um, if we simply um, take A modulo 3 equals 0, this returns an array of twos and false. And we can use this mask um, as index methods such that we get only the uh, positions of A only these indices of A where this here is true. So we get this one, this one, and this one, which is, well, 0, 3, and 6. Um, yes, we can apply values using masks, and we can do stuff using these masks because our mask operation basically um, does return a list, right? So we have this, um, a, so we get the positions where A divided by 3 is 0 here, and then we can assign values to that. So if we, so doing this here, it's basically the same as saying, well, A at the positions 0, 3, and 6, we make 10. And doing that, well, we write a 10 at these positions. So assigning values using mass is basically, again, because the mass is converted into a list of indices, which then um, uses fancy indexing to, um, to um, assign values. Yes, um, this is a bigger example. So this is just some nice way of getting the uh, iris data set from this website. Doesn't matter for you. Just notice that there are some, um, um, well, the, uh, like this iris data set, like it has the petal length, the petal width, and some stuff about these uh, flowers. And then um, the type of uh, flower this is. And um, so we can use um, our indexing here to get, for example, um, the, to group um, our flowers by their type. And then, for example, to get the mean of the values here um, according to a time. So what we do here is, well, first of all, this here is an array of um, type object, which is possible in NumPy, but which is not efficient, as we said. So we split, so we split um, this um, textual uh, column from the uh, float columns. And then we can simply go through all values of this textual columns, which are just Iris Setosa, Vesicolor, and Virginia, um, and then um, create and then take the mean of these columns where, where uh, of, of these rows where this, um, this very column, so the type column, is our one certain value. 
So this unique grouping column simply returns iris setosa, iris vertical, vertical, versicolor, and iris virginia. Virginica. And then we go through all um, rows. And for all these rows where the um, column with the name is this value, we take the mean. And this is basically a grouping such that in the end we return something which groups them by their type and returns the mean. So indexing and masking is really um, powerful and you can do many things just by smartly indexing your arrays. Okay, um, yes, this here is an exercise even from the sheet from last week. Make a number array see the positive side by replacing all its negative values by the mean of its positive values. Simply a mask and a mask assignment. Okay, um, let me just show it to you. So, um, okay, I did a new array, so I'll return a copy because the mask, if I do this mask assignment, assignment it changes the original one. And then we simply say, well, this new array at all the positions where it's less than zero, all its negative values, are supposed to be the mean of the positive ones. So we take these ones which are positive, bigger than zero, take the mean, and we assign that to all negative values which then leads to this. So the mean of all positive ones is this 3.02 something, and we assign that to all ones which used to be negative. Okay. Um, yes, we can combine masks um, using logical operators, but um, we need the bitwise logical operators. So blah, blah, blah. Different masks can be combined using bitwise operators. So, um, there are these bitwise operators, which are the end, like this, the OR, which is simply a pipe, and where the XOR, which is um, the caret symbol. And we have to combine our masks like this, well, because imagine, so this here is a mask which um, asks if the elements in our array are smaller or equal than four. So this here is simply where we can assign the result of this array smaller or equal than four symmetry a variable, and then we can combine that um, with our greater two, which we made, which we made right here. So this here is a Boolean mask, false, false, true, 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 and this here is a Boolean mask, true, 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 false. And if we combine them with our logical, um, with our bitwise end, we make a mask where, well, for every sing single element, um, we compare if uh, well, the first one is true and the second is true. This has to be with these bitwise operators and does not work with the normal end operator because the end operator simply tries to evaluate the uh, truth value of the entire array here, 
which is not defined because a NumPy, um, a NumPy array doesn't have a simple, simple truth value, and evaluates the truth value of this and then tries to combine them. But well, evaluating this is impossible, which is why um, it tells you, well, the truth value is ambiguous. So using the end doesn't work because it tries to do that for the whole array, and you want to do that bitwise. OK, so we can combine our two arrays like this with the bitwise end, and then we can um, mask our array at, these, um, at the combination of these. So array is this, and our mask is, is, is greater 2 and smaller or equal than 4. It's 2 for, well, the 3 and the 4, which is why in the end we return only the 3 and the 4. The bitwise OR is the pipe operator, so all ones which are either greater than 2 or smaller or equal than 4, um, like this, and well, um, bitwise XOR, the ones which are either greater 2 or smaller or equal 4, but not both, we get with the caret symbol. And the bitwise negation I showed you already um, in, uh, with the numpy.nan example, so we want to get all elements which are not greater than 2. Um, well, this is one and two. You have to use the bitwise operators and you have to put parentheses around um, more complex expressions. So, um, no, we don't do that. Yes, so if we do it like this, this doesn't work because we have to put parentheses around that. So this returns all values which are either smaller than two or bigger than two which is um, uh, parentheses. Don't forget the parentheses. So either smaller than two or bigger than two, which are all elements which are not two. And you can even negate that with the new set of parentheses, and this would get me only the two. All right, um, so like I said, if we do it like this, we, um, we change. Uh, so this here returns a new array, but if we um, wanted to change the value here, like this, uh, this would change the original array. So this array where it's not greater than two is only a view on our original array, and if I sign something to that, I change the original array. Sometimes I don't want that, um, and uh, for that, I can use np.where. So np.where simply figures out the indices where a given condition is true. So um, this here is our array. Uh, so here we have simply a range from uh, 0 until 8. And then we want to set the values which are divisible by uh, 3 to 0. But this changes our original array. So let's do that again um, with the np.where. We simply want to figure out the indices where a modulo, uh, a modulo 3 is 0, which is, well, the index uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 2, 0. And then imagine we wanted to make a new array where simply these values are 0. And we can simply say, well, we make a new array of the same shape. And we say b at these indices, so at these indices is 0. And we created a new one. Uh, where can also directly assign values to your new array. So this syntax reads, um, so where a, divide, uh, where a modulo 3 equals 0, um, you return a 0, and at all other positions, you return an a. And this creates this uh, at array, which is basically the same as a, um, but it's a copy. Because a is not changed, as we see here. Yes, np.argware basically does the same, but it returns the, index, the indices grouped um, by elements. So this here is simply uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3. Just the same as this one, um, but in, other, in another order, which you can not use for indexing, but is useful in other cases. OK. Um, oh, wow, there's a long countdown. Create an array of eight eight-dimensional one-hot vectors which is at this very position, so you may assume what you uh, need here. 
There is obviously um, another, there is an easy solution because NumPy is a function for this, um, but you can also use indexing. So and you can this do this one right away because this is the same as the one you had the last time, yet just you don't want to change the original one. So um, in case um, the task was not specified well enough, so this, this is the same as this np.i, which is the um, pre-specified number function for that. So what I want from you uh, in this task is have this where one, 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 blah, 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 and like where all the other ones are zero. Just in eight dimensions. I want to be quick. So this is what I wanted from you. And this is one way I did it. So this here 
creates the numbers from um, 0 to 63, we say reshapes them into this correct shape, and then sets all which are divisible by 9, which is this one, this one, um, uh, no, wait, which are divisible. Let's show you this part. So we get this, and then we set all the ones um, which are divisible by 9, uh, or which have, uh, OK, which are not well. So if we have the same modulo 9, we set all these here to 0. So these figures out the ones which are divisible by 9. And then we set all the other ones to 0, such that we have an array where all the other ones are um, where these ones are true, the ones which, where the result modulo 9 is 0 are true, all the others are false. And then we simply convert that to, um, to an integer array. Okay. And ta-da. So this is just one way, again, where smart indexing can, do, can lead to nice results. OK, um, this is the same as NumPy's given function np.i. Yes? Um, since you are making extra errors with the numbers from 0 to 7, uh, and then you should each time get an indexing error, uh, error that it doesn't work right if you can see NumPy. So um, I don't know. I feel like it would work somehow if you have this error. Can, can I get to you later? Uh, can I get to you on that later? I will just finish this one real quick and then show the homework, and then we get to that. OK, um, a new array in which all the odd numbers are replaced with negative 1 without changing the original one, where we simply use this np.where. We had this already um, and create a new array where all the ones where a modulo 2 equals 1, so the odd ones are replaced by 1. And the other ones are taken from the original array. All right, and then one last exercise. This is the very last exercise for today. Figure out the common items of the areas A and B, that means the ones where the indices, uh, where the areas match. So for example, this would figure out here this one, because there's a 2 in both places. It would figure out this one, there's a 4 in both places, and this one, there's a 4 in both places. Okay. Um, okay, I cheated here. I used the np.unique, which um, returns, like, which removes the um, unnecessary twos here because the two was there at least twice and the four also. But yeah, what we simply want is we want np.where a equals b because this simply returns the indices where a equals b, right? So this returns a true for here, a true for here, and a true for here. And then we get the values at that place. So I wanted to have um, the specific values where that of where that happens, not the indexes, indices. So I call np.unique, which simply, well, 
makes this array unique. Um, there's also, of course, a numpy function for that, which is numpy.intersect one dimensional, um, but this is basically the very same as this one. Okay, um, last but one topic here, real quick, extending arrays. So, um, so first of all, it makes sense to add new dimensions sometimes. For example, if you want, I don't know, if you want, um, in TensorFlow is, for example, useful if you have, if you normally um, give batch input to your neural network, but this time you only have, um, you want to have inference on one single data point, then you have to provide the same shape as if you had a batch, which means you have to have one empty dimension. How do you create an empty dimension? Well, we can simply use uh, NumPy's np.newaccess, um, which is the same as using none. So imagine we had this one dimensional error here, which is simply one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, which is of shape five, nothing. Um, we can reshape that to add a new axis here, and this simply wraps it into another dimension. So this is now of shape one, five. Um, and yeah, we can even add more dimensions. So using np.new axis and none is the very same thing. Um, and then here we add uh, dimensions afterwards. So everything is, so this is first dimension is five. So we take all original ones, all original values, and then we add two new dimensions. So to access a value here, we'd have to call it at the position, um, well, to get the zero here, we would have to call the array, two dimensional array at the position zero, zero, zero. Yes, um, it's useful for TensorFlow's batch inputs, for example. Because now the single data point would have the same shape as if we would have um, a multi-dimensional um, or rather a batch input. Yes, we can uh, remove dimensions. Um, for that, NumPy has um, the method squeeze, which simply removes dimensions of one. So this here has a dimension of one five, but the one is unnecessary, and if we squeeze that, make it a dimension, we make it of dimension five zero again. Um, and NumPy.squeeze simply removes all dimensions which are one. So we had this here was a um, five by one by one by one. And if we squeeze that, um, we simply make it um, of shape five again. Yes, then we can combine arrays. So um, I said it already on Tuesday, it's um, combining arrays is something you don't want to do if possible because combining arrays has, you have, so you have to have to create the first array, you have to create the second array, and then you have to combine them to create a new array. This always has overhead, and the better approach is to create an empty array of the correct shape and then fill it. However, of course, you can combine arrays, and there are, of course, functions for that. Um, so um, imagine we have um, these two, what did I even do here? So imagine we had um, these two arrays, so this is simply a range from one until 10, and this is the same the other way around. And we can simply concatenate them by using numpy.concatenate, which concatenates them both um, at the first axis. So this here is a tuple, so concatenate expects only one input, which is a tuple, so don't forget the second pair of parentheses. Um, and then, which I found only yesterday, but which is a really nice syntax, there's this numpy.r underscore and then square brackets. It's not a function, it's something else. Um, this combines all kinds of scalars and numpy arrays and even Python lists. So I couldn't use np.concatenate with scalars and lists and, uh, and numpy arrays and lists, but this r underscore and then, then square brackets simply, um, can simply combine everything. So using this r underscore, and then I can combine the two, 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 this range from one until nine, the range in uh, the opposite direction, and then this zero, one, two, three, the zero, one, two from the Python list. I can just put all of that in the np.r underscore, which is a really useful function to create arrays quickly, and which I used today all the time and never before because I just got to know it today, yesterday. Uh, okay. Yes, um, then there's append, which basically does the same as concatenation. So np.append simply takes every single element from um, the second array and appends it one after the other to the first. Even worse, because it's even slower than concatenate. Um, 
Yes, and for higher dimensional arrays, um, it's useful to stack, for example, like we can do other stuff, for example, we can stack them. So this here doesn't concatenate them along the first dimension, but creates a new dimension and stacks them. Um, there are also the functions numpy.vstack, which is row-wise, so vertical stacking, and npy.hstack, which is column-wise, so horizontal stacking. There's even npy.dstack, which is depth stacking. Um, and, but these are simply um, the correct, they simply select the correct axis for stacking. So imagine we had our two arrays here. So uh, we had, um, so this here is, why did I print the first one? Let's print the first one too. So imagine we had these two arrays here. How would it look if we horizontally stacked them? Well, we would have, we would have stacked them along this dimension. So we have first this and then basically to the right of that, the other one. And if we vertically stack them, we would have the one below the other. So what's actually done here is that H stack is concatenation along the second axis and V stack is concatenation along the first axis. Special cases for one dimensional arrays. Yeah, like I said, um, you will eventually um, combine arrays, but you shouldn't if you can, um, if there's a way not to. Yes, and then last week, um, Tuesday I mean, um, I had this error with a random seed because a random seed of zero produces the same thing over and over again. Why was that not the case last week? That's really weird. Uh, okay, I uh, know. Ah, that's what I mean. Um, a random seed of zero is a random seed, right? So if we do random stuff, so normally if we do random stuff, we expect we want a different result every time we use it, right? So if we call np.random.random, we want them to be other um, sequences of numbers. However, sometimes for testing, it's really useful um, to make them predictable, such that for testing, you always get the same ones and you can work on errors which occur for this very combination of numbers. And for that, you use a random seed. Um, if you use a random seed, like NumPy, it's always gonna reuse the same numbers over and over again. To disable it, which you should always, which you have to do always in productive code, you have to set a seed of none, not zero. So if you set np.random.seed none, you will remove the random seed and NumPy will use the randomness of your computer, which is some smart way using the system time and other stuff to make some pseudo random number. Um, and the, here we see the numbers are obviously always different. All right, so this is the last thing, shuffling arrays. So, um, numpy.random.shuffle shuffles an array, but only among the first index. So if we shuffle a one-dimensional array, this is the expected result, it's shuffled. But if we shuffle a two-dimensional array, we see that we still have this 0, 1, 2, 6, 7, 8, 3, 4, 5. So we only shuffle among the first index. To shuffle the array completely, what we, would, what we could do is we could flatten the array and then shuffle this one-dimensional array and then reshape our flattened array into the shape it had before. Um, this is um, four lines or three lines. This is rather annoying. There's also np.permutation. Um, np.shuffle, we see we call np.shuffle here and then the changes be in place. np.permutation doesn't change in place but returns a shuffled array, right? So doing the same in one line with permutation is simply we call permutation from a.flatten, which returns a new array, um, which um, is uh, the flattened version of a shuffled, and then we can reshape that to the original shape of a, and this returns something else while the original a is still unchanged. Yes, um, and then again, uh, I showed you arc sort before, even though it was confusing for myself. Um, if we are dealing with different arrays, we want to shuffle by keeping them matched to each other. For example, we have an input array and a target array for machine learning. Well, we still want to shuffle them because we don't want uh, to have um, an, an order in there, but we want, of course, the input to match the target. And what we could do for that is, well, we create a new order um, of indexes, and then we simply index our input and our target array at the same indices such that um, they still match each other, but they're shuffled. So five is still under the 25 here, but it's in a random position. Yes. 
uh, not doing this. This is another way to create a five by five array where precisely a, uh, a quarter of these values are true because um, we simply take five true ones. Uh, so this is precisely a, a one fifth of the values. I asked you for that before. Um, so this creates simply five true ones, 20 false ones, and then shuffles them and reshapes them into the shape I want to have. Yes. And then lastly, there's numpy.random.choice, which simply returns a subarray of a given size. Um, we have, so we can either draw with replacing, um, which is normally the case. So if we see here, I set the seed on purpose such that we see the five is drawn two times. If we uh, draw without replacement, we don't get a number twice, but obviously we cannot draw more numbers um, than the length of the array. So we can even specify probabilities with which to take certain elements. So this here is another way to generate an array where roughly a quarter of the elements are true because we take with a um, probability of 75%, we take the false, and with a probability of 25%, we take the true, and we do that um, in a resulting array of shape five by five, five, five. So this is another array where roughly a quarter of the element are true. Good, and then this is the really last thing, NumPy, um, so don't be confused sometimes if NumPy doesn't show you the complete array or doesn't show you complete numbers. So NumPy has these print options and you can change them using this np.setPrint options. So normally NumPy prints you like three, six, um, eight digits after the uh, dot. And you can change the precision, for example, using NumPy.print options. NumPy also likes to use the scientific way of writing variables with the exponent um, which I find rather confusing and I always turn that off. I simply suppress this scientific way of writing the numbers and say, well, that give me a higher precision. Um, and yeah, and you can also normally NumPy, um, like depending on your system, on Jupyter Notebook, it doesn't do, it, it does it only like after a few hundred numbers. So it, um, it uh, makes every shorter and I can change that at will too, such that I don't print the entire array, but only like um, for arrays bigger than having more than 10 elements, um, I um, make the dot, dot, dot in between. Okay, uh, that took quite some while longer than I hoped for, um, but that's it to NumPy. So this here is uh, a video of Jake Vanderplas, who is really uh, a guru of scientific computing. And if you want to watch this video, it's again three hours of NumPy introduction again, um, but more stuff than I handled here. So if you want to watch that, do that. And now I'm really sorry for being uh, rather late on that. Let's get to the homework real quick. So I made an announcement on Startup Piece, so you can download the homework now. And yeah, so these are your tasks. I really hope it's understandable. So it are just four different tasks which um, you're supposed to solve using NumPy. Um, let me show you that on GitHub because it's nicer and bigger. Okay, so first thing is indexing. Write a function that takes um, a shape tuple, the number of rows and columns, and returns a 2D number uh, array with a checkerboard pattern. So it's supposed to be, um, so, so if you return it for, for the 5 by 5 version, it's simply a zero in the top left corner. So it's zero, one, zero, one, zero, and vice versa. This is two lines with smart indexing. So this is um, the one you're supposed to create in the first one. Two lines if you just use smart ways of indexing. Um, Next thing, find a local maxima. So you get an array like this, um, and your function shall return the indices of the local maxima of that number, so of um, that sequence. So we see, so this is our array. The three is surrounded by, uh, the seven is surrounded by three and one, so we turn this. This is index two. The two is surrounded by one and, one and zero, which are smaller, so this is index four. The six is surrounded by zeros, five, six is index seven, and the one is surrounded by zero and nothing that counts two, so nine. So what your function here is supposed to return is this two, four, seven, nine. Um, 
you can ignore peaks spanning over multiple indices. So if there would be um, a sequence like, I don't know, if there would be a sequence 0, 1, 1, 0, um, you could either return both or none, uh, or you just ignore that. So I had a two-liner for this function, which couldn't work with these, but we don't test for this, such that it can work with two-liners. Um, so you can ignore that. What you do there doesn't matter at all. As long as there's one peak, you're supposed to return the index of that peak. Um, so again, so what, you, so what you have to do, obviously, is you have to compare a number to its neighbors. And then you can use um, indexing methods and where to figure out, well, where that is the case, and then simply return that. Yes. Oh, yeah, there's also, um, as a hint, because I didn't mention that in the lecture, there's um, hint hint a method called numpy dot sign yeah np dot sign which returns for every position so it's it's a u func obviously but it simply returns a negative one for negative values positive one for positive values and zero for zero you may need that yes um, moving average. Um, given a one-dimensional array, compute an array that contains um, the averages of a moving window. So what we do here is, um, so if we have, I don't know, if we have 0, 0, 1, well, I don't know. So if a moving window here is 3, so, um, so for, for this index, it return the moving index here is ah, it's nowhere yet, so this here returns simply a 0. This one returns a 0, too, because the moving index is here. And the next one, our moving index would be here. So this would return 1 third, because it's this one divided by 3. Then our moving window would go until here. So this one would also become 1 third. Then we would go one index more. So this one here would be 2 thirds. Uh, this doesn't even make sense. So the moving window is around this, uh, the way it's written here. So the means um, moving window of a given size centered at the respective value. So I did this here wrong, blah, blah, blah. So uh, the one here, right, this would be one third. And for, this is less confusing, Chris, good job. And for the zero here, it would be two thirds because this is this sliding windows. And at the borders, it only considers um, uh, these two values. <laughs> so. Yes, and lastly, I really hope the last one is kind of understandable. Um, so in the last one, we want to split samples of a data set. So imagine we have a data set, for example, consisting of a random number of 1,286 samples. And we want to split that according to percentages. So we want to split that in, I don't know, train test validation for your boss and never show anybody data set. Um, and in the first uh, split of the data set, there's supposed to be 5% of this. In the second one, there's supposed to be 20, 26%, 4%, 40%, and 25%. If you simply um, divided the samples by these percentages, you would get floats. So in the first one, there would be 64.3 samples. In the second one, there would be 334.36 samples, where you can't do anything with an 0.3 sample. So you would round down. But if you round down, you didn't use all the samples. In this case, we only used uh, 1,284 samples. So we omit two of the 1,000 something samples. So what you're supposed to do is to find a way that splits the remaining two samples, or rather it splits all the samples, such that uh, the resulting values are as close to the demanded percentages as possible, um, but we use all of the samples. So in this very example, we see that this here is a 321.5. So if we take 322 samples here, we'd be as far as we were if we would take 321, but we would use already 1,280. 85 samples, and then we would have to put something, we would have to make this 52 samples because where the error, the difference, um, the summed absolute distance between 
Um, if we take 52 samples here, instead of taking the 51.44 as the smallest one, what we have to do here in this case is make one more sample here, distribute one sample here and one sample here. So you have to have the whole, you have to have all samples um, split up such that the error between the percentage in, as a float and as an integer is the smallest. Does it make sense? Okay. Um, there are more possible solutions sometimes because, well, if this would be also 0.5, you could split it either here or here, um, but you will figure that out. So both versions work. Right. Yeah, sorry for not giving you time to work on this homework. I need to be quicker next time. Yes. Uh, uh, no, that was due now too. Wasn't it? Wasn't it? Ah, then it's possible to register. Wasn't it you now? Oh, good that I didn't show that. <laughs> ah, okay. Mm -hmm. I will just add that again. You have the same question or what? Ah, okay. Okay, then bye-bye.